Welcome back to Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. Another nice day. Uh, everything was good today. We were busy at the shop, but I want to talk about our special guest tonight. At the age of 15, uh, won his first track championship at Prescott Valley Speedway, uh, IMCA track champion. Also at the age of 15, IMCA Arizona State champion. Then the IMCA Western Region Rookie of the Year, followed up the next two years with IMCA Track Champions at Canyon Speedway or Canyon Raceway and Arizona Speedway, also winning another Arizona IMCA state title. At the age of 18, mom and dad sent him to Nebraska to race, which led to the Nebraska IMCA state championship. I didn't know you did all this stuff, Tim. <laughs> Next year, he moved to Iowa, winning an Iowa, winning Iowa track championships at Hancock County Speedway, Hamilton County Speedway, um, Stewart International Speedway, Marshalltown Speedway, and Boone Speedway, along with the IMCA Iowa State Championship. Then there was 2023, <laughs> IMCA TV Winter Nationals Champion, Dakota Tour Champion. Harris Clash champion, and the 2023 IMCA Super National champion recording 21 wins for that year. 2024 hasn't been too bad either. Stayed in the IMCA Clash of the Creek at 141 Speedway the first night for a $10,000 payday. Runner up at Dakota Series uh, this year. Friday night, you recorded your 100th IMCA win at Marshalltown Speedway, and then of course last night you backed it up with a $2,000 payday at the Clay County Speedway. Easily one of IMCA's best racers in the country right now at the age of 30, driving the Precision Performance Performer Blue and Yellow number 4TW, Tim Ward. Glad to have you on here, Tim. Well, thanks for having me, Bob, and reminding me of how long I've been doing this. <laughs> yeah, I was like, damn. I didn't think you were that old and uh, reading all this. I'm like, he's been doing this for 15 years. Yeah, still old. <laughs> and, and you're currently registered for the 33rd Annual Harris Clash at Deer Creek Speedway in Spring Valley, Minnesota. So maybe you can back that up. We've got some two-time champions of that event. That'd be awesome. It'd be yep. a heck of a deal. How's Chad today? Oh, we're doing good. We had a another busy monday you know mondays during the race season are always crazy uh fixing the the stuff the in, unfortunate accidents over the weekend so <clears throat> really a busy day and um uh, we've been just got our factory support number two rig we call it so we got our our smaller trailer getting that ready to go hopefully maybe debut that later this week so trying to get our factory support rigs ready for the the fall tour here so yeah, there's a lot of racing coming up in August and September. Well, even actually at the end of July. I mean, this week you could race every night of the week except for Monday if you wanted yeah. to. So definitely a lot of racing going on, no doubt about it. We've been pretty fortunate, you know, uh, on the shop side of things. We've had a lot of shop customers run real good. You know, of course, we luckily with uh, the 007 winning that uh, deal up there at the Clash of the Creek. Uh, so that was pretty cool. And Troy ran in second, and uh, that was pretty neat. Uh, Troy finally had a good night. Got his got his motor back from Kevin Stoa at uh, Stoa Stoa's Kevin Stoa's motor back in the car and, and uh, ran real good. And then uh, went uh, went to course to Marshtown. Got to see Tim and get his 100th win. That was pretty cool. And. Uh, Friday or Saturday night, went to Boone Speedway. They had that, uh, what was that, King of the Catwalk or something is what they called that deal? I don't know, something like that. And, of course, Dallin Murdy won that. Uh, McBurney was second. Uh, just kind of ran out of time. Uh, and then, of course, McBurney ended up second in the uh, uh, modified feature. Now, that's pretty much what I got done this week. Kind of seems like I've been busy this morning. I was actually thinking, man, watched the indie race on TV yesterday. That wasn't all that exciting. 
<laughs> kind of a one kind of a one lane follow the leader deal and they're all running half throttle so i'm like damn this is pretty exciting racing so where do you go next tim uh wednesday at uh clay county for the veterans tour you're gonna do the whole veterans tour yeah that's the plan awesome this week yeah cool good. well that should be pretty neat um but uh, that's always a great tour um i know i'm not going to make spencer i might make algona mm -hmm. uh, otherwise i'll be in boone for sure and then of course the de france memorial is at marshalltown on friday night and uh, that's going to be a good show with a lot of good late model cars there and, and so that's going to be pretty good mm -hmm. so i'm looking forward to that and uh, i think it pays what a thousand to win the modified like 15 15 yeah yeah we uh uh bhe night is august 9th at marshalltown um we finally got it to the point where the sport mods is going to pay a thousand to win the modified is going to pay a thousand to win and uh, hopefully i can get a sponsor tomorrow and, and we can help out the stock cars so it pays i'd like to get it so it pays a thousand to win the, the four classes which would be kind of cool yep so that's my goal so i've been working on that helping jerry work on that deal of course working on the harris clash and the entries are coming in real good uh, i've been real real pleased with that i mean it started out slow which is kind of typical um but a lot of entries are coming in so we're we're looking forward to that that's going to be it's going to be another fun event i always enjoy going to deer creek What's your opinion of that place, Tim? <laughs> I love that place. So it's got to be pretty good. Yeah. I wish I could go there more often, but uh, definitely one of the better places throughout the summer we get to hit. Yeah, it's always fun up there. They do a great job. I mean, they've yeah. got a, a great concession stand in the, in the grandstands. And, I mean, it's, you know, it's going to be on IMCA TV, but you still – even on even on TV, it's it's not the same as being there. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully the fans will show up this year, and and uh, like I said, it's going to be a good event. Uh, Kyle Strickler is going to be there this year, uh, driving uh, uh, Jarvis Motorsports number eight. So that's exciting. Uh, he hasn't been there for a long time, so that's pretty cool. All right, first question, uh, Larry, uh, look at the hot shoe joining the party. Hopefully get to see you again in Oklahoma and Arkansas this year. Yeah. Awesome. That would be cool. Uh, Joey, what do you do when your car doesn't want to turn very good around the bottom? And also, what do you do when you're tight from the center off? um well that's why it doesn't want to turn around the bottom because the car is probably a little too tight and that's yeah. you know more the norm anymore um uh, you know with the tires that we have it's kind of an uneasy feeling with that right rear not wanting to to, to stick so they tighten the car up a lot and then all of a sudden the front end doesn't want to stick and then of yeah. course you know coming up off the corner, I mean, it's just, you, know, you just got too much left to attraction. You, you know, either put some stagger in it, you know, to help it turn. What would you do, Tim? Man, it's, uh, I'd like to guess no more what, where he's struggling at, but yeah, if he's definitely, uh, you know, not turned before he picks the fuel up, you know, uh, that's just where the car's going to go, I guess. So I guess it depends if it's a side bite problem or just too much traction. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Michael, on a northern sport mod, we've been setting left rear limit chain to stop at 45 degrees angle. My static angle is at 24. If I move it up a hole or down a hole, do I adjust the limit chain to maintain the dynamic 45 degrees? Um, you would want to definitely maintain that 45 degrees because, you know, like a sport mod, that two link stuff, you don't. You wouldn't want it to go over the 45 degrees because then all of a sudden it's just 
pushing, trying to push straight up, and then you're going to get uh, a tire hop. It's going to be hooked up too much. And so I, I strongly recommend staying with that dynamic. However you do it, stay with that dynamic. Uh, 45 degree angle because that's I think that's key in these cars I mean, even on an open car I mean a modified car I think that chain and, and that droop deal is so crucial uh, Ed what would you what would what would be the expected result from increasing the spread on the right rear four bar five and a half on the cage top and bottom and spreading equally on the frame maintaining same angle at the starting point what do you think chad yeah that's a that's a we used to do that a while back so i mean it basically slows that right rear cage it's going to give it more of a two link feel it's going to slow it down and put the car i'd say on the right rear harder kind of feel like a two link so when we did that uh a few years ago a lot we'd increase spring rate so if you're running a 200 and you spread your bars you probably put a 225 or 250 in there so you're getting that that uh, roll basically in the slow motion and then you can add rate to the spring to drive the tire into the racetrack yeah that makes sense what do you think tim yeah i agree just to try to keep that right rear feel so it's not just so dumped over there i guess now you focus a lot on right rear feel, don't you? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we've got time for questions. We've uh, anybody wants to chime in here for questions? Uh, I see mom there chimed in, but she didn't ask no question. Yeah, I don't know what if that's just a I'm here deal or what. I think that's the <laughs> case. Hi. Hi, mom. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah well that's pretty courageous of old mom and dad sending you up to uh nebraska when you're 18 years old <laughs> yeah it's kind of like here you go bud you're on your own they call it my college <laughs> they call it your college all right that's a good way to look at it never thought about that yeah there you go that's no <laughs> doubt all right um wesley <laughs> GRT man himself, Wesley Wise. Tim, do you ever run wheel spacers? All four corners, man. <laughs> Especially with that four off wheel. Yeah, that um, that's definitely a, a key on these things. We play a lot with that wheel spacer deal. Yeah, um, you know it's it's not uncommon to even run a, a one inch wheel spacer on the right side with a three inch wheel just unhook you know get the thing so it rotates well and mm -hmm. doesn't get over in the right rear too much but the you know, wheel spacers are a huge deal uh jared thanks for your question there wesley and jared hey bob and chad jared again with the leaf spring camaro from last chat i got 900 right front thousand left front spring i changed the rear to try to gain side bite. I did a 175 left rear leaf and a 225 right rear leaf. Car is great on entry in the middle. Can run any line I want, but I'm having a little to wait on it a little bit more uh, when it gets back to the throttle when it's slick. Left rear shock is a 6.3 and the right rear is a straight five um you know I, I think you could help yourself with a little more compression on that left rear shock um that's pretty light uh, for what we're doing nowadays uh you know it's pretty common to be in that nine nine ten range and uh so hopefully that helps you um oh mom's coming to marshalltown huh <laughs> Uh, car is only 51 rear and 88 pounds of bite um 53 left side uh well that 
that low arrear percentage is not going to help you. I mean, that's that's going to help. I mean, that's going to keep the car a little bit free coming off the corner. Um, you know, I would consider if you can uh, adding some weight and and even on a real dry slick racetrack, even if you're already at the weight rules, you know. I'm not opposed to running a little bit heavy because, first of all, you're going to go slow anyway. And, and so sometimes, like with a leaf spring car especially, or even a two-link car, I'm not big on rear percentage on a four-link car, but a two-link car or a leaf spring car, I, I think rear percentage is, is kind of an advantage. Um, let's see here. Uh, at what Dylan. Yeah. Dylan Patterson. I run, oh, I run. Oh, no, I missed all kinds of them. 557. Right. 570 mm -hmm. at Vinton. All right, 570 at Vinton? Yeah, around there. 557, up and up. Yeah, I watched that race at Vinton last night. Uh, it got pretty dry. That's um, what I heard. Yeah, it was pretty dry. It was a nice racetrack. I mean, it was it was very, uh, it was a very good racetrack. I mean, it wasn't rough. It was very smooth. Uh, they, those guys did an awesome job with the racetrack, and it was pretty slick. So it uh, definitely, you know, took some talent to to do that. And some guys were running the bottom. Some guys were running the top. And Joel was right, you know, was right through the middle most of the time. So it's pretty good racetrack. I thought the races were good. Um, Chris, at what degree do you start losing traction on the left rear bar on a sport mod? Well, I think it, once you, in in dynamic mode, once it gets past that 45 degrees, uh, I think you start loading the tire to the point where it starts scrubbing it, and it, it just like I said, it can create kind of a hop. Uh, uh, it'll, it'll get that. Rrr, rrr, rrr sound uh, the motor will be trying to lug and then it's just it's just not working out and, and what happens is you get too much degrees then it kills it in the middle of the corner because it doesn't want to rotate like it should so i'm not a big believer you know like i said static wise we're usually around 26 and dynamic is usually around 45. um tony is running a ump open modified but the chassis is a three link left rear spring in front right rear spring on top the spring table is higher on the right rear would it be beneficial to put the right rear on a slider if so it would be front or behind um you know you're running a two link with an open modified i'd probably put it behind uh, the right rear behind because that's going to make the car a little tighter in the, getting into the corner, it's going to make the car tighter off the corner. Uh, sometimes it can get a little tight in the middle, but you just have to kind of drive through that. But if you're running an open modified, you've got enough power to drive through that. <laughs> I mean, that's not a problem. Not like a crate motor. Yeah, I mean, if that's spring on top on the right rear, uh, just so you're measuring that correct, it's where the tip of the screw jack is, not where where the mount is on the frame rail. So just make sure that you're you're measuring that ground to the screw jack tip on the right rear and then left rear is a coilover so you measure to where the bolt goes through the coilover. Well, and if that right rear spring is, is, is on top, like you say, you could always try 11 inch spring. I don't know what you're yep. running for. You're probably running a 13. You could try an 11 inch spring and that will definitely make the car stick better. Um, Spring on top was pretty popular, what, five, six, seven years ago. Yeah. A lot of the A-mods were doing that on the right rear just to take the cage out of the equation and, and give it that two-link feel where there's no, you know, you don't increase the, the rate of the spring through travel, and it, then you can put a stiffer spring in there and drive the tire into the track. Um, Michael says, if you change a modified from Pinto spindles to Speedway three-piece spindles. Do you need to change any ball joint lengths? Yes, you definitely do. Um, I can't actually tell you off the top of my head what you need to change about it. Uh, it's more important to change the lower ball joints 
because you, you, if you had a pendulum spindle, you probably had a tall ball joint in there. I mean, you could have a short ball joint. The pendulum spindles definitely need the shorter ball joint because just the way the, the, the spindle is. Um, Cody, IMCA modified running coil over in the right rear have been struggling the past week to feel like we're in the racetrack with the rear tires. What would your go to to feel like we are in the track, not on top of it? What would you do, Tim? Coil over in the rear. Like he's talking about the left rear. Yeah, just uh, well, I think it's a coil over right, you know, coil over in the rear. So it must be coil overs in both rears. Yeah, he's been struggling the past week to feel like he's in the racetrack with the rear tires on a dry racetrack. Yeah, I mean, I guess just, you know, you got to get it over on the right side when the track slows down. I mean, um, maybe the right rear is too, you know, too solid or too rigid and this won't roll over or something like that. Not sure what he's doing for left rear spring and, and, and all that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, definitely would probably, I don't know what you, what, you, what Cody, I don't know what you're running for springs, but, you know, we've had pretty good luck with the soft left rear when it gets slick, um, you know, lower on the right side of the car or, or raising the left side of the car one or the other, putting a little more angle in the, in the car to, to help it get that roll a little bit more. Uh, that seems to, to kind of help it. Um, you know, and then, and then it just kind of depends too, you know, what you're running for a pull bar because, I mean, that could have an effect on it too. Um, switching to a dry slick track, do you put more panhard bar split to help the right rear more or how, how much split across the front to help plant the right rear or the right front on a metric clipped a mod what's your opinion on that chad well <clears throat> i mean the more panner bar angle is definitely going to get the motion but if you get the motion and overpower the right rear you're just going to slide anyways so it's kind of a balancing act there um i feel you know i don't know what you think about j bar angle tim but sometimes you know more isn't better in that situation yeah i like to run mine kind of flat I'd say compared to some guys um but I like I don't really worry about sticking my right rear as much I guess as maybe some guys like um I like the car freer on entry but yeah definitely anytime I add more rake to the J bar it just kills traction it's kind of why I'm not a fan of it yeah I would agree with that I, I would work to be honest uh, you know I, I do like Tim said I, I would work on keeping the car free getting in and work on getting traction by you know adjusting your bars or or something to increase forward traction when you get on the throttle so that when the car does feel a little free that you're able to traction it up and, and drive it straight up off the corner well Wesley's old buddy Tanner the other part of GRT equation Tim, what are your thoughts on right rear top rod adjustments? <laughs> They're just a bunch of characters. Uh, I know where I know what he means with that comment, but uh, what I feel about it is uh, don't move it. <laughs> That's what I think. Yeah, Stand. I would agree with Tim. I'm not really big on moving that right rear upper bar. No, you can weld it in. Yep. <laughs> I don't actually even move the left upper bar at all. <laughs> if it's tight, just drive it harder. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, Joel, for UMP style street stock with the engine set back in line with the ball joints, what load would you guys look for on the right front spring and what weight spring uh would would you use um car is let's see here uh 
I'm proving I, I'm kind of struggling here with my business. Just a second here. Let me get that. A car has also tie down right front shock. Um, what load? Boy, I, you know, I wouldn't know what to actually say on that one as far as. I think know. a UMP street stock is like a stock car, I believe. Oh, is it? Yeah. Um, right front spring and what weight spring would you use? Well, I'm not sure what your rules are or what your weight limit is, but, you know, a lot of the IMCA stock car stuff, depending on, on the builder, um, it is usually around 800, 900 pounds. Um, you know, that, that seems to be pretty common. I know there's some guys out there uh, with some cars that are running softer ride fronts, but I think the roll center is quite a bit different in making them, making them need to use that softer spring uh, to get the car over on the right front. And, and it works well for them. I mean, they win races, so it, it just depends on what the chassis builder actually would recommend would be my suggestion on that one. And having a tie down right front shock, that's pretty common. Uh, you know, kind of just depends on how you build the shock, you know, how much zero point it's got in it and, and what the, 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 the 100 number says. Because um, you can have a tie down that has a whole bunch of zero point in it, and which means that you just you can't pull that thing apart for nothing. And then the car doesn't want to get back to the left rear. So you, you kind of have to have a, a shock that's a tie down, but not so severe on the very one inch and two inch numbers. Um, okay. Helping a friend with an IMCA modified and it won't turn unless the J bar is as low as we can go on the pinion. I didn't measure, but the right rear spring mount is higher than the left rear. What would you do to help that? Um, what would you say, Chad? Well, I mean, there you go again with too much J bar. You know, if it's <laughs> if it's if it's buried on the pinion, you got a lot of angle. You know, if the car won't turn, it's because the J bar is buried. So. It might be just a situation where you got to raise the pinion and then flatten it out a little bit to get it to rotate. Um, the spring table, you know, if it's higher on the right rear, is going to not let it roll on the right rear. So, you know, uh, not sure what you got for springs and stuff, but there's it's a balancing act. So, I mean, one of the number one things I think people do is they think they need to bury the J bar to get bite or traction or grip, and that's going to make you too tight rolling to the middle. So, when you let out of the fuel, if the panhard bar is wrong, you're rolling tight before you pick up the gas, and you're going to have to bend it, right? I mean, Tim, you can probably explain that feel of yeah. rolling tight, and then you got to do something to make the corner because you don't want to run into your buddy. Right. Yeah, so I think weird going on there because he says he's he can't turn unless it's buried. So I'm like, holy crap! I would be I'd be way too tight. Maybe it's so tight it's it turns. I don't know. Yeah, that's kind of weird because it's going to migrate a lot with a lot of angle too and make it even tighter. So yeah, something yeah. else has to be going wrong. There's got to be something bound up or something. Yeah, I would definitely look further into that deal. Um, probably try uh, relocating it right rear. Uh, you know that right rear spring so that the spring table's down because that makes a ton of difference and would help the car substantially uh, so that would be some of the things that i would probably do a tim is making his first appearance at boone for the super nationals with his hobby stock do you know what gears the hobbies will with open motors are running tim i am sorry i wouldn't have a clue um I definitely, of course, I got a couple guys uh, that work for me that would know that. And uh, maybe one of those guys are listening and, and they can chime in here and, and tell us because I, I wouldn't have a clue. I don't even know what the modified drum for gear, right? All I know is they just need to go to the front. I don't know what they're the other stuff in the material. Um, 
Steve, on a stock car, what type of shock should we run on the car that we are running a 16 inch 125 spring on the left rear? Side seems left rear side seems car wants to try to bottom out. Hmm. Um, Kind of depends on the driver in that situation, on how stiff a shock would go. You know, if a guy is pretty good at trail braking the car, a softer left rear, and when I say softer, I mean like a nine compression, somewhere in there, uh, is going to give you more traction. However, it will let the car fall down if you're not real good at trail braking the car. So... If that's the case, then we have to go stiffer on compression to kind of make up for, you know, what what the driver's not doing, and um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's good, bad, or indifferent. It's just what you got to do to make it work for the driver because as long as the driver's fast and feels comfortable, he's going to be fast, and the car's going to be fast. So it kind of depends on. You know, how you actually like driving the car. Um, you know, like I said, if, I, if I've got a guy that's good at trail braking, we'll probably go a little softer. Uh, if he's not real good at trail braking, we'll go stiffer to help him keep the left rear up. It's all about keeping left rear angle on that car so you have traction coming off the corner. Uh, Cody says left rear. Um, do you remember Cody's comment? Yeah, he was talking about, I think, traction with the shocks behind and the slick. Um, yeah, just, uh, I guess, it's hard to know. Yeah. Feeling like he's on top of the racetrack. Yeah. I mean, those are pretty common springs, I'd say. Yeah. Definitely crazy there. Um, yeah, if, you're the, if, if the left rear is behind... Um, you'll have to run a little bit softer compression to, to get the feel and, and maybe a little bit more rebound. Uh, the problem with it being behind, uh, we've tried it both ways, and I've tried it both ways dozens of times, and, and the problem that you run into is the car doesn't want to enter real good with the spring behind the housing and the shock behind the housing. Uh, where well, that shock in front of the housing kind of helps deacceleration and keeps the car a little bit tight uh, getting in, where otherwise it's, it. I mean, it's got straightaway speed and, and corner exit speed, but it hurts corner entry. Wouldn't you say, Tim, you've had it both ways? Yeah. I mean, I like running it behind for the traction it gives me, but it definitely can make entry harder, you know. It's harder to drive uh, keeping it up. Um, so you, you know, you'd probably have to run maybe even a little more extended load than, uh, when you're split, I would say, um, I think like 150 to 200 is pretty, pretty common. Um, Jared, and what else he's got? Adding, um, Jared says, would adding 20 pounds to the right side down tube help traction off? You said more compression on the left rear. What about the right rear shock? Would you leave it alone or just swap the left rear shock if needed? Um, with as heavy as your car is, you know, I'd probably contemplate leaving it alone. Um, if you wanted to, you know, if, if you felt comfortable, a softer compression shock is going to help you off the corner more. And if you put more rebound in it, like a 3.5, 3.6, something like that number, or in your case, like a 4.5, 4.6, uh, would help traction off too. Um, it's not uncommon to run more rebound, softer compression and more rebound for a slick racetrack uh, on the right rear, no matter what suspension you have. Uh, Cody says he's got an 80 pound left rear and a 225 pound right rear. That's pretty normal. Yeah. 
Uh, Vince, Southern Sport Mod is 20 degrees in the left, right, rear to left rear temperature difference. Concerning? Uh, let me read that again. Southern Sport Mod is 20 degrees in the rear, right rear to the left rear temperature difference concerning. I don't think that's too bad. If you only got a 20 degree split between your rear tires, that, that's a fairly decent balanced car. Um, no matter how good the car is, um, you know, your, your right rear should run a little warmer than the left rear. So I would think a 20 degree split would be pretty decent. Um, Vince, how can we get a Southern Sport Mod to lift the left front tire off the ground like some of the big... <laughs> Well, huh. um, you know, as much angle as you can possibly put in that left rear and flattening that right rear bar, both those two trailing arms, and flattening that right trailing arm out, and putting a bunch of angle in that left trailing arm if you can, depending on what the, I'm not familiar with the Southern Sport Mod rules for the rear suspension, so I can't really uh, tell you for sure, but in theory, that's what would work the best. Um, you could put a softer right rear spring in it, but I think you're just going to get action. You're not necessarily going to load the tire. You skipped Jeff um, Green. I did? Oh. Yep. What is a good load to start with on the 80-pound left rear spring on an IMCA modified slick, crummy racetrack? Well, you kind of answered that a little bit ago, Tim. About 150 to 200 pounds is what you yeah. recommended. Yep, you can just tune on that. Yeah, I, that's a good good combination. Um, Jason, it's a 175 right rear and a 100 pound left rear. Now, I don't remember what Jason. That was the J bar up. <clears throat> oh, up on the frame. J bar down on the pinion. Oh. So I mean, what it's that, doing is it's probably overpowering the right rear tire and making it yeah. loose because it's overpowering the 175 spring. So you might want to think about flattening it out, increasing rate in the right rear spring and yeah. you know, calming it down a little bit and maybe getting some, some spring table into it or something else to get the roll, some ballast. Yeah, I, I think that's a pretty good, pretty good deal. Um, Robert says, what's the best length for a UMP modified lower bar and what height front springs do you run nine inch? Um, lengthwise, you know, we've played with all kinds of different lengths on that left lower bar and it kind of seems to me like we're in that 14 inch range seems to be pretty good. Um, and uh, the, the and what height front springs do you run? Yeah, we actually just run the nine inch. We we tried some of those the other stuff, and I I I just don't think there's an advantage there. To be honest, I think there's hype, and then the problem is is you got to have a bunch of different springs and. Uh, yeah, it's not like you can carry, you have to carry the same length springs all the time. So if you do change the front spring. Um, Sean, can you explain the advantages or disadvantages of using a tight helix right rear on a stock car? Um, well, go ahead with that, Chad. <laughs> So, I mean, the tight helix is just, uh, the, the coils are really tight. So uh, you need to get a lot of travel out of it for it to work properly. You know, the first inch, two inches, two and a half inches of travel, the rate's about the same. As it starts coil binding and the coils get real close together, they're storing a lot of rebound force energy. So when that thing gets to that point of coil binding, it has the rebound advantage. But if you're not getting a lot of travel, it's not going to work correctly. But stock cars get a lot of travel. So a lot of the stock car guys like that feel in the right rear. I don't think many of the modified guys are are using it. I don't know, Tim, if you have any experience with the tight helix, if you ever ran one. Or... Yeah, many years ago, 
I mean, people have tried it, but uh, yeah, I think some sport mods are still running it. Stock cars, it's pretty, it's fairly common. Um, you know, we don't run it because I like the consistency of a, a standard spring. Um, you know, because it just depends on how much the car rolls over. But you know, I know, like I said, I know there's some pretty fast stock cars out there that run. Yeah. Um, Robert, four link lower bars that is. Yeah, you were talking about lower bar four link. Yeah, I think you did yeah. that. Uh, Logan, I have a question for Tim. Oh, good. <laughs> How much do you change your driving style and setup for a 50 lap race versus a 20 lap race? If you do change something, what would it be? Or do you prefer to set the car up the same as you would normally and just try to manage your tires better? Um, it's really uh pretty simple just uh pretty much just how much fuel we need and and uh kind of tire prep i guess you know how much we groove and sipe the right rear uh we definitely worry about from a from a 20 to a 50 lap race um other than that i just do my same old from you know heat to feature 20 to 50 laps i mean we might tighten up a little bit more for the long race but usually we're already tight early because of the extra fuel load so we kind of just depend on that. Well, and that's always been one of your strong suits. If you have to start a little further back, I mean, your car always comes on really good the last few laps. I mean, I've, I've seen you go from 10th to second in a 15 lap run at the end of a race. Yeah. Yeah. If you can, if you can make your, your car drive well with, you know, less fuel. So, you know, for that situation, where you got to put a lot of fuel in it for a big race, it might hurt you a little bit at the beginning, but so you're there at the end is kind of what we like to do. Um, also, UMP mod open motor, where should the pull bar on the rear end be mounted? Center? Uh, kind of depends on what you're running for a pull bar, um, but center, I think, is, is a good place. Um, you know, or slightly behind depending on like i said what what the pull bar actually is uh, if you're running a, a spring bar that gets a lot of movement um i don't know you might have to start slightly ahead of center but center's pretty good what's your opinion chad yeah i mean i'd start somewhere in the center to be neutral you know unless it's an offset rear end if there's offset built in the rear end then you're probably going to need to be to the right of center and then I would just tune accordingly, depending on what you need for, for traction. Um, Jared, on a hobby stock stock car, do you like the front corner weights being with in 100 pounds or should not worry about that? I don't know. You know, I'm pretty old school. And if I can get a race car that the front ends within 100 pounds of each other, uh, I think that's a pretty balanced race car. So I kind of like that. Um, now, the stock car is a little bit easier because you don't run as much left side weight in, in a stock car. Um, the modifieds you know, have a little more left side weight. So it's, it's pretty tough to get that within the 100 pounds, but uh, it's still doable. And I, you know, I don't know if I'd say it's going to be a night and day difference, but I, I just feel if we get... Too much split in the front end, the right rear or the right front doesn't have enough load on. And if the right front doesn't have enough load on, it's gonna push. Um, uh, Larry, IMCA modified. What is the advantage of a spring bar to a biscuit bar? Uh, 9010 shock or any shock recommendation on the top? Um, what would you guys say on that one? Well, I'd say the spring bar, uh, when you, and Tim can elaborate, you know, but the spring bar, when you decel, it tends to shear traction a little bit more than a biscuit bar. So on the biscuits, you can drive in the corner. Uh, it's going to drive in tighter. I would say it takes just a, 
split second longer for the pucks to get back to their install than it does a spring. A spring stores energy again and gets back to its install quicker than a than a puck barb does. I would always run a 90-10. The 90-10 valving is going to be different on a spring bar uh, than a puck bar just because of that factor. So you, you'll have more influence with a spring bar than you do with a puck bar. Um, and Tim can talk about <laughs> I'm sure you've ran every pull bar known to man, spring, puck, everything. Yeah, it's been, I mean, we've, it's been a while since we've ran a spring bar, but, uh, you know, what you said makes sense to me. Um, but definitely always a 90 10, just uh, makes the car easier to drive. Could imagine one without it. Um, AJ, a Northern Sport Mod, what kind of difference would you see if you mounted the pull bar behind the rear end versus above or in front of the rear end? Um, well, you're definitely going to want to always be above the rear end. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's for sure. If you, if you go behind center to center with a solid upper bar, I'm not totally convinced that there's a noticeable difference. Um, you know, we've played with different things there and I've never found one way or the other, you know, with a solid bar that it, it just really makes a ton of difference either way. Um, it doesn't affect, I mean, it's with, even with a solid bar, you're still going to get some rear steer in it, but uh, it doesn't really affect the, the upper link that much. Um, Russ, how do you tune with left rear load? Do you use it mostly for corner entry? I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Mostly, mostly corner entry. Um, that's the most important part of the racetrack, I think. Now, if you get a little bit too much load in it, uh, it tends to make the car a little free getting in. Yeah. and can give you a throttle push. Right. Um, Bill, do you like running a tie-down shock on the right rear sport mod for slick? Um, I do. Uh, I, I just think that anything that you can do to slow the, the reaction of the car climbing back up and getting angled in that right rear bar is going to help delay the traction on the right rear I mean, you're always going to have traction on the right rear because you got so much load on it from corner entry through the middle anyway. But if you can delay that that jump up off the corner so it doesn't increase angle in that left rear or that right rear so fast, I think it makes the car tighter off the corner. So any great words of wisdom, Tim, for anybody out there? Um, well, with like that shock deal, I mean, anything to kind of help the car stay in attitude too helps, especially when it slows down. Yeah, that's pretty key, keeping the car in attitude, because if that falls down, you lose everything. Yeah. And then the front end pushes. And... Yep. Um, when pulling a spring with a load stick, at one inch, two inch, and three inch, should the load numbers be similar in rebound to what they are in compression, or is it common for them to vary? Well, you're going to have um, you're going to have less rebound force than you do compression force. Um, if you're pulling that load stick on a, assuming you're on a right front of a modified, you're where the shock is, so a load stick's never going to give you the actual rate of the spring. And you have, you know, it's a variable because you're not, to have the true rate of the spring, you'd be directly through the center of the spring. So all the load stick is going to do is give you a comparison and let you change springs equally, you know, when you go from a 400 to a 500 consistently and give you data from that track, you know, to tune the one inch, two inch and three inch numbers. Um, but it will have less rebound force than it does uh, compression force. The spring will always gain rate. It'll never lose rate it loses rebound and that's when you know a spring goes south so when we 
when we take a spring and put it on the ultra force machine, we'll run it automatically in a test and you'll look at the rebound side of it and you'll graph that. And then you'll run 10 nights and run that spring again. And you'll see where that fade is. And the fade is usually on the rebound side and that number splits apart on the graph. So that's why we talk about how, how much maintenance and consumables and, um, you know, I'm screaming at one of my employees this afternoon because his car's terrible. And I'm like, when was the last time you did this? When was the last time you did that? How old is this? How old is that? I got one answer of three years and I almost fired him. <laughs> I'm like, dude, come on. You got to maintenance, maintenance these things and you got to you got to build a notebook. So the load stick is going to give you that, you know, that notebook full of details. But keep in mind that your number on your load stick isn't your actual radiator spring. Right. And one thing, like you said, when a spring goes bad, people don't understand it. They'll, they'll take and put a spring in a radiator and it'll rate perfectly fine. But in a standard radiator, all it does is check compression. Well, springs go bad on rebound, not compression usually. Yeah. All right. Unless they lose height. Um, but otherwise, you, you, that's why a lot of guys will say, well, I didn't say all I did this week is change the spring and the car got a whole lot better. Well, I mean, it's it, springing is kind of almost, in my opinion, like a tire. Um, yep. It has so many nights on it and throw it or carry it in your trailer to loan to somebody or something. <laughs> um, Bill wants to know about the right rear chain on a sport mod. I actually run my right rear chain really loose. Uh, I keep the chain so that it helps the rear end not fall out of the car because our cars are overslung. Um, I never put any load in that right rear. It, it's traction, um, you know, and, and I can see if you had a perfectly smooth racetrack, it could have an advantage. It, it will help the car traction-wise off the corner. The problem is if, if you ever, and Chad, you've got a, a story about that. I mean, it... Uh, if you hit a rut or a hole or anything like that, man, that thing's going to turn right in a heartbeat. Yeah, I don't know if Tim's ever had the right rear chain too tight, but when you when you hit a hole, then the car veers right instantly. So, but like you said, it's there's traction there, but you really got to be careful tuning that. I don't know, Tim, if you if you play yeah, with yeah. it at times and have over tightened. We have in the past, yeah. Uh, when we first started messing with it many years ago, we had it so tight that the car started hopping yeah and uh i had to pull off the track but um yeah i'm not a huge fan of it um i've definitely noticed it giving me traction before but i wouldn't rely on it um russell chaining the right rear on a four bar modified well we just kind of actually explained that. Yeah, same same thing. Thing. we yeah. covered that um, Jared, I'm allowed to run chains. Would it be, be worth trying running a left front chain with about 1.5 inches of travel? Uh, totally. Um, I, I think that left front chain is, is crucial if you're able to run one, uh, limiting that traction. When, when, when you limit the, the amount that that thing can actually lift what it does is actually in fact we actually played with this back when i was working with you tim down in arizona mm -hmm. uh, started trying that chain tire on the left front and it created some traction down there uh, the car can be a little bit freer getting in but straight line traction is definitely better when you shorten that up um aaron what's your opinion on center pull left rear birdcage top left top left bar what's your opinion on mounting the left rear coilover on top of the axle housing or attaching it to the top of the left rear cage i've never had any experience with that well anytime we ever put the trailing arm up at the center line of the axle tube it makes a lot of influence fast and it made the cars super erratic and hard to drive. So we, I mean, we made a batch of plates and we really never went back to it after the guy that ran it said it was terrible. But I mean, if it was, if it was a two link car and you only had the one bar, so we have the cages where you can on a two link car where you can move it forward and up. And I don't think it depends on your rules. So make sure you check your rules. But 
on the two link cars, what we like to do there is move it forward a little bit and up a little bit so you can run less angle to get the steer in the motion quicker. So like you talked about earlier with having that thing at 45, but going past 45, you know, you get that too much angle in there and it's going to be terrible. So that allows you to run a shorter, flatter bar and get that angle and, you know, be able to, to time that out differently up in the forward location. But on an A mod and a four link car, we never had any luck going up there. I don't know if you ever tried that, Tim. No, no. Um, Adam, left side J bar versus right side bar on pinion on a Wasoda A mod. Left side J bar frees car up on corner entry. Um, I mean, yes and no. Uh, I've fun. never, I've never tried a right side bar on a dirt car. When we ran pavement, that was pretty common. Well, I think he's just talking about the the J bar hooked up on the right side of the pinion. Oh, gotcha. Left side of the pinion. Um, I don't know. I've always run on the right side because, of course, with IMCA rules, you got to have a 19 inch bar, and it would be too far outside the frame to do it on the left side. Um, I know that the, the, back in the day, there was a lot of people that ran when you could run a shorter bar on that that uh, left side. A lot of people ran it that way, but I, I don't have any experience with it. Yeah, I'd say maybe a short track, but the problem with doing that is when you move the, it actually moves the roll center to the left. So when you get the left, the rear roll center behind the front roll center, when you transition into the corner, when the rear roll center is behind, it's automatically tighter. So you got to like rotate through that. I don't know if you've ever moved it left, Tim, but you know, it makes the car really tight on entry and you kind of got to bend it to get it to go into the corner, I think. Yeah, I've never, I've never had one to the left. We, uh, a few years ago, we were playing with a straight bar that was, um, that was under the pinion and uh, it gave us a lot of traction, but it, it felt like, like uh, it was just, basically putting traction to the left tire like it seemed like it took all the traction away from the right rear and and you know once the brown would go away we weren't very good but it had a lot of tra instant traction it felt like um jared what will you notice if you're too tight or too loose on the left front chain never messed with one um you're not going to notice a big difference being too tight or too loose um it the, the more you choke that chain down on the left front you know it's going to keep it from rolling to the right rear and it's going to make it roll to the the left rear so it's going to make the car a little bit tighter coming off the corner and that's kind of the advantage of that chain um i've i've never really you know i mean and i'm not a big believer in moving the j-bar but and, you know that's something a guy could move the j-bar a quarter of an inch if you if you shortened up the left front um kind of standard on that left front is an inch and a half a droop um you know i've seen some guys go to one inch and we've tried one inch um but it just seems like it takes almost too much right rear out of the car when we try shortening that left front chain up too much What's your opinion, Tim? Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> um, Ryan, so without a spring smasher, checking springs in rebound at one inch, two inch, and three inch with a load stick, is that the best way to check if rebound has fallen off? I think you could do that, wouldn't you be able to, Chad? Well, it's not. I mean, like I said, it's not completely accurate but it's right. going to give you data so if you put that spring in there new and you use your load stick and you run that spring through the motion new and document your compression and rebound forces and that spring fades you're going to notice a difference in that number through travel as it fades over time yeah uh, that makes sense to me um well uh we've got oh i forgot all about telling everybody about our <laughs> New feature win decals. Ah, nice. Of course you can't you can't have one, Tim. But there's, <laughs> there's, guys, there's guys out there that could get this. So, 
anyway, if, if you got some feature wins, make sure we know about it so we can send you those. Uh, remember, this is the time of the year that you need to take and freshen up your shocks, your brake, your suspension, rod ends. We're through. We're, we're over halfway through the season. Um, you've got a lot of big specials coming up to pay good money. Um, you know, like I said, this week, you know, guy could race every night, but Monday, and you got to keep your stuff fresh if you want to run up front. I mean, it's just it's. And, and, Super Nationals is coming up. You definitely want, you don't want to go there with a gun with no bullets in it because you're going to be SOL. <laughs> uh, that, that deal is so intense and, and the competition in today's racing in all divisions is so close that uh, that's the difference maker is having your stuff fresh. Yeah. Um, registration for the Clash. Uh, for the uh, early registration discount, uh, that ends this Friday, uh, the 26th. So those of you who haven't registered, make sure we get those um, get those in so you save that 25 bucks. And, um, we'll be back in two weeks, which would be August uh, 5th, uh, the actual day before the clash. And our next guest is uh, Kyle Strickler, uh, two-time winner of the Harris Clash. And uh, he'll be driving the Jarvis Motorsports number eight car. And so we're looking forward to, I, I haven't seen, uh, he had a good, uh, he had a, a couple good nights up there on the tour and he ran pretty good. Uh, one night he was running real good and had a flat tire. So it kind of didn't help his finish like he should have been, but he hit, he, they, they ran good. So we're looking forward to that. Looking forward to Tim being up there, and we can't wait for that race to come. And of course, you know the title sponsor of that race this year is Weir's Manufacturing Machine. So I thank you, Chad, for coming on board and helping with that. Uh, that's it's 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 really great to see manufacturers that give back to the racing community. Um, you know, it's just like we're trying to put together the BHC night on August 9th to to get some good paydays put together for uh, the, the modifieds and the sport mods and the stock cars and, and the hobby stocks. Um, you know, without all these customers, we'd be SOL. And, and uh, so we do everything we can to try to help the customer as much as we can and, and just have fun doing it. Uh, just like this show. It's, it's just always a good time. Great to have you on tonight, Tim. That was uh, awesome. I think Tim might have had one or two many beers when he actually okayed that deal the other night. I don't know for sure. Uh, can't say no to you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just I, he's standing there, and I asked him. And he says, "Okay, no, no, yeah. no I, I asked you on Friday night, not Saturday night. Yeah, you were good on Friday night. <laughs> Saturday night might have been the night where you might have had a beer or two." But that's okay because you weren't that's racing and awesome. you were having a good time and I always enjoy talking to you. So it's a lot of fun. And once again, we'll be back here in two weeks. Uh, good luck this week, Tim, and we'll see you on Friday night. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Thanks, Chad. Yep. Thanks, everybody. See you, Tim. See ya.